Picture a diesel engine so distinctive that its sound alone could identify it from blocks away. The Detroit Diesel 8 V71 dominated American highways and waterways for nearly 40 years, yet it sparked fierce debates that continue today. Some mechanics called it bulletproof. Others called it a maintenance nightmare. This engine ran hotter, louder, and faster than anything else in its era. It powered Greyhound buses, Coast Guard vessels, fire trucks, and generator sets. But put it in the wrong application, and it would destroy itself within months. After interviewing dozens of operators and mechanics, one thing became clear. The 8 V71's reputation was built on extreme performance in the right hands and catastrophic failures in the wrong ones. When General Motors' Detroit Diesel Division introduced the 8 V71 in 1957, they weren't trying to build just another diesel. They were creating something fundamentally different. This was part of the Series 71 family, named for the 71 cubic inch displacement of each cylinder. With eight cylinders arranged in a V configuration, total displacement reached 568 cubic inches. The revolutionary aspect wasn't the size or configuration, it was the two-stroke cycle. While most diesels used four strokes per power cycle, the 8 V71 completed its entire process in just two strokes. Every crankshaft revolution produced power. This meant higher power density and faster engine speeds than conventional four-stroke competitors. Making a two-stroke diesel work required solving a fundamental problem, how to get fresh air in and exhaust gases out with only two strokes. Detroit Diesel's solution was forced scavenging through a Roots-type supercharger. This wasn't a performance add-on. Without the blower constantly pushing air through the cylinders, combustion couldn't occur. No blower meant no engine. The cylinder construction used wet sleeves, not dry sleeves, as internet forums often claim incorrectly. These were full-length removable liners surrounded by coolant. The wet sleeve design provided superior heat transfer and simplified rebuilds. Instead of machining the entire block when cylinders wore, mechanics simply replaced sleeves, pistons, and rings. Fuel delivery used unit injectors, one per cylinder, mechanically driven by the camshaft. Each injector was self-contained, eliminating high-pressure fuel rails. This made field repairs simpler, but required precise calibration. The cylinder heads weren't individual per cylinder. Instead, each bank of four cylinders shared one head. Detroit Diesel engineered the entire package for rapid service. Greyhound mechanics became famous for complete engine swaps in under an hour. The engine mounted on a cradle that could be unbolted and rolled out, while a fresh, dyno-tested replacement rolled in. The old engine then went to the rebuild shop while the bus returned to service. This modular approach kept entire fleets running with minimal downtime. Lubrication relied on gear-driven oil pumps forcing oil through filters and coolers before reaching critical bearing surfaces. The system worked brilliantly when maintained, but had specific failure points. Pressure relief valves could stick open, causing dangerously low oil pressure. Bypass valves, though less critical for pressure, could malfunction and allow unfiltered oil to circulate, creating long-term wear concerns. The cooling system channeled coolant through the block, heads, and oil cooler. Without regular flushing, scale deposits would accumulate, creating hot spots that warped heads. Compression ratios ran tight, 17 to 1 on standard versions and 18.7 to 1 on N-series variants. These weren't forgiving tolerances. The electrical system featured heavy-duty starters designed for harsh conditions. Northern operators particularly valued the 8 V71's cold start reliability. Unlike many diesels that struggled in freezing temperatures, this engine would fire up without excessive cranking. Turbocharged variants arrived later, boosting power output significantly. But contrary to popular belief, the turbocharger didn't replace the roots blower. Even turbocharged 8 V71s still required the supercharger for scavenging. The turbo acted as a pre-compressor, feeding pressurized air to the blower to improve volumetric efficiency. Turbocharged versions needed different injector calibrations, often included aftercoolers, and had distinctly different performance characteristics than naturally aspirated models. The nickname Screaming Jimmy perfectly captured the engine's character, with red lines typically set between 2,100 and 2,300 RPM, this diesel screamed rather than rumbled. The sound came from the combination of two-stroke firing frequency, 
roots blower howl, and high-speed valve train operation, all happening faster than traditional four-stroke engines. But the nickname represented more than just noise. It described the engine's personality. While most diesels of that era prioritized low-end torque and lugging ability, the 8V71 came alive at high RPM. It loved to be revved hard and responded instantly to throttle inputs. This made it ideal for applications requiring quick acceleration and sustained high-speed operation. Fire departments appreciated the instant response. Bus drivers loved the peppy acceleration. Marine operators valued the ability to hold steady RPM for hours without complaint. The engine didn't just run, it performed with enthusiasm that operators could feel through the throttle pedal. Turbocharged versions amplified the distinctive sound even further. The combination of turbo whistle, blower howl, and two-stroke bark created an unmistakable mechanical symphony. For enthusiasts, that sound represented American diesel engineering at its most aggressive and unapologetic. The modular design meant mechanics could perform major repairs without pulling the engine. Heads, injectors, even complete cylinder kits could be swapped with basic tools. This serviceability became legendary in industries where downtime cost money. An experienced crew could diagnose problems, order parts, and have the engine back in service faster than competitors could even schedule a dealer visit. Despite its innovations and devoted following, the 8V71 had serious limitations that made it unsuitable for many applications. The most critical weakness was its inability to handle low RPM operation or heavy lugging. Unlike modern diesels producing peak torque at low speeds, the 8V71 needed consistent high RPM to maintain proper scavenging and cooling. Drop the engine speed too low under load and problems cascaded quickly. Scavenging efficiency fell. Exhaust gases didn't clear properly. Combustion temperatures spiked and internal components began cooking themselves. Many operators discovered this limitation the hard way when they tried using 8V71s in equipment designed for low-speed torque. Agricultural applications proved particularly problematic. Tractors idle extensively, lug through heavy soil, and operate across widely varying load conditions. The 8V71 hated all of this. Engines installed in farm equipment frequently overheated, fouled injectors, or cracked heads. This wasn't a design flaw, it was a fundamental mismatch between engine characteristics and application requirements. Oil leaks became the engine's most notorious reputation problem. The joke went, you don't change the oil in a Detroit, you just keep adding it. Valve cover gaskets, blower seals, and airbox drains all developed leaks with surprising regularity. Even well-maintained engines would seep or spray oil after moderate wear. While rarely catastrophic, the constant oil weeping created messy engine bays and required frequent fluid top-offs. Heat management proved another Achilles heel. The two-stroke design generated more heat per revolution than comparable four-stroke engines. When cooling system maintenance fell behind, consequences arrived quickly. Clogged coolant passages, failed thermostats, or neglected water pump maintenance led to warped heads and scorched pistons. The engine didn't tolerate cooling system neglect the way some four-strokes did. Common field problems included valve cover leaks, blown cylinder liners, and excessive crankcase pressure. When rings wore or liners developed problems, blow-by pressurized the crankcase, stressing seals and contaminating oil. Fleets that skimped on preventative maintenance faced these issues repeatedly. The 8V71's reputation suffered most from inappropriate installations. When matched to applications it wasn't designed for, it failed spectacularly. Farming equipment, stop-and-go delivery trucks, and variable load industrial equipment all exposed the engine's weaknesses. These failures created lasting negative impressions in industries that never saw the engine used correctly. Even the distinctive sound became a liability in some markets. Long-haul truckers loved the mechanical howl. Municipal fleet managers received noise complaints. Operators experienced fatigue from constant high-frequency vibration and sound pressure. By the 1980s, many organizations replaced screaming jimmies with quieter, more flexible engines simply to reduce operator complaints and noise pollution. This engine demanded understanding. Operators who learned its characteristics maintained it properly and matched it to appropriate work got legendary reliability. 
Those who treated it like a conventional diesel got expensive lessons in mechanical failure. When properly applied, the 8 V71 achieved remarkable success. At sea level, under sustained load, turning high RPM continuously, the engine proved nearly indestructible. Marine service became one of its greatest success stories. Coast Guard cutters, Navy equipment, commercial tugboats, and fishing vessels all relied on 8 V71 power. Maritime environments where engines run at fixed RPM for extended periods perfectly matched the engine's strengths. Public transit represented another ideal application. Greyhound buses and municipal systems across North America made the 8 V71 their workhorse. Drivers appreciated instant throttle response. The two-stroke scream became synonymous with reliable public transportation. Fire departments capitalized on the engine's fast revving character. Emergency vehicles needed quick launches and sustained high RPM. Urban fire trucks making short sprints between stops played perfectly to the 8 v 71 strengths. Stationary generators showcased the engine's endurance. Hospitals, factories, and construction sites used 8 v 71 powered generators that could run for weeks continuously. Regular maintenance allowed these generators to accumulate tens of thousands of hours before major rebuilds. Military applications valued the field serviceable design. Landing craft and support equipment used 8 V 71s extensively. Combat zones and remote bases needed engines that mechanics could repair without specialized facilities. The modular design allowed crews to swap heads or injectors without pulling the complete engine. If major damage occurred, the cradle system enabled quick engine replacements. Over-the-road trucking in the 1960s and 70s saw widespread 8 V 71 adoption. Long-haul drivers who understood the engine's characteristics and maintained proper RPM ranges got excellent service. With appropriate gearing and careful tuning, these engines hauled freight across the continent reliably. Healthy 8 V 71S matched with correct transmissions could handle both mountains and flatlands effectively. The engine still appears in custom applications today. Tractor pull competitions, vintage truck restorations, and custom hot rod projects continue using 8 V71s. Enthusiasts choose them not just for power, but for the unique character and mechanical feel that modern electronic engines can't replicate. That distinctive scream and purely mechanical operation appeal to builders wanting analog performance. Environmental regulations ended the 8 V71's production run. By the early 1990s, increasingly strict emission standards made the engine's continued manufacture impossible. The EPA's Tier 1 requirements, phasing in from 1996, targeted nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, and unburned hydrocarbons. The 8 V71's two-stroke design produced emissions that couldn't meet these standards without fundamental re-engineering. The engine's mechanical simplicity and field serviceability became liabilities in the new regulatory environment. It lacked electronic engine management, couldn't support exhaust gas recirculation, and had no provision for diesel particulate filters or NOx after-treatment systems. Retrofitting a two-stroke diesel with modern emissions equipment wasn't merely expensive, it was technically impractical. For manufacturers and fleet operators, retiring the engine made more economic sense than attempting redesigns that would compromise the very characteristics that made it valuable. New four-stroke engines with electronic controls could meet regulations while offering comparable or better performance. The business case for continuing 8 V71 production simply disappeared. As new installations ceased, the engine's reputation began fragmenting based on individual experiences. Operators who'd maintained them properly and used them appropriately remembered legendary reliability. Those who'd inherited neglected examples or used them inappropriately remembered constant problems and frustration. Oil leaks remain the most universal complaint across all applications. Even engines in otherwise excellent condition mark their territory constantly. Blower seals, airbox drains, and valve cover gaskets all leaked with predictable regularity. This wasn't always mechanical failure. Often, it was simply how aging 8 V71s behaved. Veterans who'd run them hard accepted the leaks as the price of admission. Newer operators saw them as unacceptable design flaws. Many of the engine's worst failures resulted from misapplication rather than design defects. The persistent myth about dry sleeves continues despite overwhelming evidence of wet sleeve construction. 
Every rebuild video and technical manual confirms the wet sleeve design, yet the misinformation persists online. Another misconception suggests turbocharged versions solved all problems. While turbocharging increased power and efficiency, turbocharged 8 V71s still required high RPM operation and suffered when treated like low-speed torque engines. The fundamental operating characteristics remained unchanged. People often discuss the 8 V71 as if it were a single uniform product. Reality was more complex. Naturally aspirated and turbocharged variants, marine versus land versions, different injector ratings, various compression ratios, and numerous tuning profiles all existed. Not all 8 V71s behaved identically, and treating them as interchangeable leads to confusion and disappointment. The engine's demise wasn't caused by a single fatal flaw. It resulted from a changing world demanding cleaner air, quieter operation, and electronically managed engines. The 8 V71 offered none of these characteristics. It was a purely mechanical product of its era. When the world's requirements changed, the engine couldn't adapt. But concluding that obsolescence means inferiority misses the point entirely. In appropriate applications with proper maintenance and knowledgeable operators, the 8 V71 ranked among the most effective diesel engines ever built. It simply didn't belong everywhere and never pretended otherwise. Today, the 8 V71 survives in collector circles, custom builds, and as a cultural icon from diesel's golden age. It reminds us that engineering excellence doesn't require universal applicability. Success means excelling at your intended purpose. The 8 V71 did exactly that for nearly four decades. For those who worked with them, the sound of a screaming jimmy represents more than noise. It's pure mechanical nostalgia from an era when engines had personality, character, and distinctive voices. The 8 V71 didn't whisper or hide. It announced itself proudly and delivered performance that matched its bold personality. That's a legacy worth remembering, leaks and all.